So hello everybody. I suppose I'll tell you a little bit about how we came about um, and what our goals are um, and how we're getting on in achieving those and, and our road to being self-sufficient in terms of energy and carbon neutral. Um, so the Energy Co-op was originally established in 2012. Um, up until then, I suppose in late 2011, the islands all had independent um, subcommittees of development co-ops that were working on energy related matters. But I suppose because it's such a broad issue, um, um, they decided then to establish um, a cooperative that would represent the three Aran Islands and that would um, just focus on, on energy related matters. Um, the co-op is community owned and it's non-profit. Um, membership in the co-op is only open to residents of the Aran Islands um, and you must have a, a, an address on the Aran Islands to, to become a member and membership is 100 euros for life so it is I suppose realistic and easy for, for, for all of the residents of the islands to, um, to become members and shareholders. Um, in 2012 we fixed um, a, a very fixed and definite set of aims and objectives. Um, I suppose the most ambitious of which and the, the main and most important ones were for us to be carbon neutral uh, by 2022, for us to be self-sufficient um, and independent in terms of energy production and generation and, and use. Um, and I, yeah, I suppose like the bottom one there is definitely the most the, the most ambitious um, and the one that we are striving the most to achieve. So um, I suppose we then had to map out our, our road to to achieving these goals, um, and so to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and to decrease our carbon footprint, um, there were three main things. And there's I suppose there's an awful lot in between, but the three main goals. Um, and things that we needed to focus on were the retrofitting of older housing stock, and uh, the electrification of transport and heat, and renewable energy generation. So like any town, I suppose, um, especially in the Iron Islands, most of our housing stock are quite old. They're stone-built houses. They're very, very difficult to, to insulate, um, probably not very comfortable in some cases. Um, and we definitely saw that the work that we began to do from 2012 onwards was having a massive impact on people, people's lives. It wasn't just about energy efficiency and energy related issues. It was making lives a lot more comfortable and homes a lot more comfortable for people on the islands and that was a massive uh, thing for us to see. Um, so the stone, the stone houses was one challenge. Um, the, the, a lot of the same houses would have had timber frames, single pane windows and doors. Um, uh, they would have had very, very little attic insulation. We were surprised actually at how little attic insulation was, was on the islands. Um, but up until now, from 2012, we have about 50% of the houses on the islands retrofitted to some degree through the SEAI, particularly the BEC schemes. Um, and there's work still ongoing on those. Um, we have a long list of houses still to, still to get through, but we've made great headways. Um, then the electrification of heat and, and of transport, but of heat was a big issue. So um, we do have quite a, an older demographic, I suppose, would be would mainly on the islands. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people might live alone and that kind of thing. And we were seeing that they were very, very interested in having um, their houses retrofitted to the likes of the air to water heat pumps. Um, because that was uh, practical, it was it, it meant there was an awful lot less lugging coal and gas and in and out of the houses, um, and it made a big big difference um, to their lives. So at the moment, there is roughly about ten percent on across the three islands of houses have um, switched from oil boilers or kerosene boilers to um, air source heat pumps, and we do have some um, geothermal as well, but it is mainly air to water. Um, one difficulty that we are seeing with these is actually training people to use them to make sure that they're working at their most efficient. Um, we have, um, we're working very closely with NUIG and with Mitsubishi at the moment um, to, I suppose, help people understand how to program their heat pump. Not the, s the same settings don't work um, for, for everybody. So we're working very hard on that at the moment because we're seeing people with really high bills. Um, and that it was actually costing them more than their previous fossil fuel system. Um, and so that's a big challenge for us now at the moment is to make sure that, we're, that people are educated on how to use these systems. Um, the thermal comfort in houses has drastically improved be because all of the houses that have air to water heat pumps have all been insulated really, really well. Um, and this is really, really important. 
Um, having constant hot water and, and fewer bills to concentrate on is a massive plus for people and that's before you even take into account the environmental benefits um, to the island. So the electrification of transport then is another challenge in itself. Um, the SEAI in 2011, just before the co-op uh, was set up, introduced a pilot scheme where they brought um, about eight electric cars to the islands, so six of those were on Inishmore, um, and they stayed on the islands for two years. So six people on Inishmore had them for the first year and then they moved to, two, to six different families the following year. And that really got the ball rolling in terms of um, electric cars on the island. People got to see how well and how suited they were for the island and how well they worked on the island, especially because of the short distances. The largest island is only nine kilometres, not even nine kilometres, I don't think, long. So it was, um, they really are ideal for all of the short distances. Um, at that at that time electric cars were ex especially expensive to buy and um, people don't generally buy brand new cars for the islands um, but the second hand market is really having a huge impact on that um, and we're seeing more and more electric cars coming onto the island which of course is increasing our electricity demand um, but at, the pr at present we have about 13 electric cars on, on Inishmore which is quite a high number when you take into account the total number um, the energy master plan that we, as we're a member of the um, SEAI's uh, Sustainable Energy Communities Network, um, we were, uh, there's three stages, there's learn, plan and do. So at the plan stage, we put together our energy master plan with the help of the SEAI. Um, and that was a huge help because we got to see problems and pl in places that we never had even really thought about. And we got a clear picture of exactly what was the biggest consumer of fossil fuels on the island, what was, uh, where, where all our energy was going and where we needed to focus to make the biggest change. Um, so you'll see now in a second, but the ferries were by far the largest consumer of fossil fuels coming to and from the islands. And they're also the main means of transport between us and the mainland. Um, heating then in, in, in homes was a close second. So at least we'd already begun working on that. Um, but ferries are definitely something that we're going to have to target. Um, to reach our, our aims for 2022. Um, so like I said, the Energy Master Plan was completed in 2018. Um, it's a living document, so we're adding to it all the time. We're, we have a database now of all of the imports um, of fossil fuels to the islands. We also um, have data as to how much electricity is being brought to the island. Um, and what was very, very interesting is that we were able to see that there's about 50% of the electricity that leaves the mainland is lost just because of the long journey that it has to make into the islands. So that in itself is a very inefficient system. Um, that same cable actually broke in 2016. It was struck, um, meaning that the two smaller islands were completely cut off for two weeks and relied very heavily on um, diesel generators that had to be flown in. And you'll see that that had a massive impact in our fossil fuel consumption for that, for that year. Um, so having a clear uh, picture of the existing situation on the islands um, has helped us, I suppose, to focus our efforts um, and to, to plan a little bit more strategically where we're going to go. Um, having a breakdown by sector and by fuel type has been invaluable and I suppose it means that we have more information to share with the community and that means they can, they can be more involved and, and play a, bit, a bigger role. Um, it's also, I suppose, the, the opportunities have been uh, broken down by sector. So we have the commercial groups, so the hotels and B&Bs, um, all, all playing their part now too. Um, so this was the breakdown of energy consumption from the Energy Master Plan. So as you can see, the maritime, there's very, very few of, the, of any of the fishing boats included in that figure because we don't have um, any large boats really based on the island full time. They, they are based in Russaville on the mainland and they refuel on the mainland. So this is just um, the ferry consumption really and one or two very small boats. Um, and that is definitely something that we need to target on, whereas we had no idea where um, that would fall on this chart before undertaking the master plan. Um, residentials, and as you can see, that the heating um, in residentials is another one that at least we have been working on up until now. Um, these are the figures from 2012 until 2016. So as you can see, coal has been reducing gradually and we're in a very unique position in the islands that we're able to monitor really closely how the imports of, of fossil fuels to the island, it, regardless of where people buy their coal or gas or oil, 
they all are transported on the same cargo ferry so and they keep a record of everything that they transport um, so it's great to have a really um, a speci specific list of, of everything that's coming in and out um, you'll see there in, <laughs> in the diesel figures at the bottom this one here on the end uh, for Inishir, I suppose Inishman wasn't affected as much but Inishir's um, diesel consumption in 2016 when they were relying on the generators that happened in August in the busiest time of the year <laughs> for tourists on the island um, and their, the diesel consumption was way off the charts as to what it was even in 2012 or 13 um, and that was purely because the cable had broken down. Um, I suppose our plan for energy generation then in the short term, um, a lot of the houses on the islands have benefited from in the BEC scheme from installing um, PV panels. Um, there's a huge, huge demand for these on the islands. Actually, a lot of the people on in a shear when the when the panels or when the cable was broken were still able to charge their mobile phones. They were generating enough electricity during the day to charge their mobile phones from their PV panels when they had no other electricity. Um, and that really drove home for people how important it was for us to be independent and self-sufficient in terms of energy. Um, we're still relying on a cable at the end of the day that is about 20 or 25 years old um, and that has had very little maintenance on it because it's so difficult to, to carry out any work. Um, about 10% of homes across the, the islands have PV installed um, and like I said we have a huge list and it's in, there's a massive demand for PV all across the islands. Um, the early stages of, we're at, at the moment, we're at the early, very early stages of a public consultation on a wind turbine for the Aran Islands. Um, we, this is something that we've been working on for a very long time. We are really, really restricted um, on the islands because we, pretty much the whole three islands are covered in the special areas of conservation. Um, and that's a massive obstacle in itself. So, um, the oh, Galway County Council, I have to say, have been very helpful in, in giving us some advice and, and telling us what we need to do and where, and where we need to start. Um, but so far, we've had massive support on the islands for, the tur for a turbine. Um, and I really think this, the turning point for this was in 2016 when the cable broke, um, because people really saw that there was a need for there to be local generation and not to be depending on this cable that's getting older and older every year. Um, we are also, I suppose, because we're talking about electrifying the heat and transport on the island. Our demand, our current demand, is growing all the time and we're hoping that that will continue to grow, our electricity demand. So we are considering that we, we may have to supplement the wind at some stage with maybe solar or utilising hydrogen as for storage. Um, the ferries would be an ideal solution for this um, and for, using, for the possibility of using hydrogen. Um, and we're, we're hoping that once the ferries have, have to be change they're, they're all about kind of 20 years old at this stage so once they get to their the end of their lifespan there might be an opportunity then to replace them with something more um, that's using more renewables instead of diesel. Um, ap apart from all of that we're also quite active in European research projects um, and these are really helping us to shape the work that we're doing and to plan a little bit more. So I'll just run through them very quickly so for the first one is Respond um, I suppose this is the one that we're the furthest into at the moment, and this is based on demand response. We have um, 12 pilot houses on Inishmore at the moment, um, and they're being fitted with sensors on their PV generation, on their total consumption, um, and on their appliances like their tumble dryers and washing machines and things like that. And this is, um, they're able to clearly see on their phones and on their tablets um, and on their fridge exactly how much energy they're using and how much they're generating. Um, and this means that they're wasting an awful lot less PV um, putting, I suppose, more thought into the way they're using their energy. I think there's a huge trend or a huge habit of people, I suppose, from, from the night rate meters really, is to wait until the evening time to put everything on and to always be waiting until the evening time to stick your dishwasher on. And then when they have PV on their roof, that's completely wasted if they're not making sure that they're using it and getting the most benefit. So that's been a really, really interesting project and it's really been helpful for the pilots. Sea fuel then is one based on um, hydrogen as in transport and it's based specifically on islands. So um, Tenerife will actually be producing hydrogen um, and using it in their trucks there in the port, but they will be doing a feasibility study on Aran and on the possibility of producing hydrogen and using it in transport on the islands. 
Um, geofit then is a really interesting project because that is based on retrofitting. So geothermal is a fantastic system, especially when you're combining it with underfloor, but that's not very easy in, when you're retrofitting a house. It's fine if you're building it and using it from the outset. Um, and we're coming across all sorts of problems like the stone houses with very poor insulation um, and things like that and finding new and innovative ways to come across and to overcome these issues. Um, I'm sure Greg, who's coming up next, will be talking a little bit about this last one. So um, we are sub-partners in CVPP, which is another interreg project, um, and it's proving really, really interesting. Um, as part of that project, a electricity supply company called Community Power has been set up. Um, they are buying and selling 100% renewable energy, um, and we're seeing in the last couple of weeks especially a massive interest on the islands in Community Power. Um, and it's, it's just great to see people thinking that way and moving in a different direction. We actually have a project at the moment um, on the school in Inishman where they have um, won a competition with Friends of the Earth to have PV panels and Community Power have very kindly um, dis uh, decided to purchase any excess electricity from that school. Um, and it's, it's been a huge, they're really, really excited about it. The students are, have built a, a PV bench um, to win the project. So they've built a bench in their woodwork class with PV panels and they're learning an awful lot about it as they go. Um, and I think that's, I'll leave it up to questions now because it's a little bit broad and I just think I'll get caught up in one thing. Um, so I might as well open it and talk a little bit that way. I think it's easier.